Hello everyone, in this series we're going to talk about debugging PIC microcontrollers. Even though the concept of debugging might be a bit complicated for a beginner, it'll be extremely helpful when learning peripherals, testing and developing your code in general. I'll also be using debugging in my future videos to show you how everything works, which is why I'm making this series first. In these videos, I'll be using PIC18F46K22 along with PICIT3, so we're gonna tackle 8-bit microcontrollers with a cheap programmer to keep everything simple and more relatable to a beginner. Also, I have an ongoing PIC microcontroller tutorial series for absolute beginners, which you can check out if I talk about something you're not familiar with. So, let's get started. First, let's get the terminologies and basic information out of the way. Then, I'll show you a quick example on why debugging is so useful, without going into too much detail. In programming, debugging refers to the process of finding and resolving issues or bugs in your code. Most people these days are familiar with the term bug through video games, but to explain it clearly, in programming, bugs refer to errors in code. These errors can be of many type, or they can be caused by different means, but you can refer to any piece of code that is malfunctioning as buggy or bugged, and thus the process of finding and resolving those bugs is called debugging. Now, the term debugging doesn't refer to just one method. For example, in my delays video, I used LEDs to determine if the oscillator block was configured properly through their blinking speed. That is also debugging, so any method you use to visualize the workings of the code to detect errors can be referred to as debugging. But in software development, when you talk about debugging, the first thing that will come to people's mind is the method of stepping through a given code, line by line, and observing the results by stopping or halting the program in each step. If you don't have programming background and don't know how that works, don't worry, I'll be showing you a quick example soon. Programming a basic project that you can fit in one page usually doesn't require extensive debugging, unless you're tackling a new concept or approach. But imagine programming a complicated system with hundreds of lines and tens of unique functions. Don't worry about what this project is, I'm just showing it as an example. Take this variable for example. It's a global variable that will be changed throughout the code. Imagine being able to stop the program and see its value at any moment or exactly at a certain point, like when it's called in a specific function or something. Or imagine being able to stop the program and inject your own value to it, to see the response of the system. Can you imagine how useful that would be? If you can't, you'll see in the future when you get deeper into not just programming microcontrollers, but for programming any software in general. Now, before we continue, you need to know how a microcontroller executes a program, since debugging is fundamentally tied deeply with program execution. If you've been watching my videos, you should have a good idea about the basics. I've talked about this in short in my reentrancy video. Your microcontroller has RAM, which consists of a bunch of unused registers that the microcontroller can access to store variables. These locations have addresses that the microcontroller uses to access them, to perform read or write operations. This should be easy enough to grasp, but this only covers the data storage, right? How about the program? How is a program stored? How does microcontroller execute a code? The way programs are stored is not actually that different than RAM. Much like RAM, your microcontroller has programming memory that your program gets loaded onto. The difference is that this is a flash memory, which is non-volatile, meaning the contents of this memory are not lost when powered off. This is why, even if you power off and on your microcontroller, it will execute the same program. Now, these locations also have addresses, starting from 0 to however much programming memory your microcontroller has, which is roughly 64,000 for this microcontroller. Your compiler will generate the instructions to execute when you compile your code, which then will be loaded onto these addresses, and the microcontroller will execute the instructions address by address, starting from 0 and incrementing, which is how your program gets executed. Note that some instructions make the microcontroller jump to a different program address, so the program won't necessarily go from address 0 to 64,000 step by step every time. Now, we won't go too deep into instructions and whatnot. What you need to know from here is the way in which the microcontroller executes these instructions step by step. There is something called program counter. Now, this is a really important term, so try to remember it. A program counter is just a counting register that starts from zero and increments its value on each instruction clock. This counter points to the program addresses and the microcontroller looks at this program counter to fetch the next instruction to execute, which again on each instruction clock will increment. This is how the program is executed step by step or instruction by instruction, 
and the jump to program address commands I talked about will pretty much overwrite this counter to point to a different address. This program counter scheme is a must know when it comes to debugging, the reason for which you'll understand real soon. Now, the program counter is usually referred to by its abbreviation, which is PC. Don't confuse this abbreviation with a computer, which we refer to as PC as well. In CPUs or processors, PC stands for program counter, which is the register that points to the next instruction to be executed. I've said that in software development, debugging usually refers to stepping through your code line by line and inspecting the values and results and etc. PIC microcontrollers and MPLAB also have this capability, and we'll get to that in a bit. It is the same for MPLAB, but unlike developing software for your computer, with microcontrollers, you're programming a more hardware-oriented system, and one that doesn't come with many resources, which makes the process a bit more unique. For PIC microcontrollers, debugging is a feature of the programmer and the microcontroller, so not every programmer will have debugging capabilities, and not every microcontroller will support some of the debugging features, since some of those features need to be implemented in hardware inside of your microcontroller. Always check the datasheet to make sure. Luckily, most beginners use Picket 3 for its cheapness, and Picket 3 has support for debugging, albeit it lacks some of the more advanced features. Know that there are dedicated debuggers you can purchase, which will come with more features, better speed, and of course a matching price tag. But this is intended to be a beginner video, so I'll only talk about Picket 3. But don't be discouraged, Picket 3 still supports most debugging features, and you can always upgrade down the line if you think that they're not enough. Also, some of the features that are not supported by Picket 3 or the microcontroller can still be enabled and used through the simulator, which we'll talk about in a separate video. Also, the debugging is done through the normal programming lines, so you don't need extra connections. But for debugging, the MCLR pin has to be set to reset functionality, so you can't use it as I.O. while debugging. The same also goes for the programming lines. While debugging, you can't use their other functionalities. Now, explaining debugging to a person who has never used or seen it would be quite difficult, so I'll first show you a quick example of the process without doing anything complicated, but don't worry about the process yet. Everything I'll be doing in this example, I'll explain in the upcoming videos. We're not gonna prepare any physical circuitry to keep things simple. Instead, we'll just focus on software. Here, I've got an empty project. I'll write a function that adds the digits of the past number and returns it. For example, if I pass 132 to this function, it'll return the sum of each digit, which would be six. I'll name it digit sum, and it'll take and return an integer. Now, I'll write the necessary code first, then explain, to keep it short. Here, we define the variable to be returned, so it'll contain the final result. I'll initialize it as zero. Now, when adding digits, we don't care about the sign of the number, right? Even if the number is negative, we'll just add its digits and return it. But if the number is negative, it'll affect our code. So we'll just check if the number is negative, and if it is, we'll just multiply it by minus one to make it positive. Now we gotta extract the digits and add them up, so I've made an infinite loop that will loop until all digits are extracted. First, we'll check if the number is zero, since the number passed to this function can just be zero, in which case, there's no point in going any further, we can just return the result as zero. But if the number is not zero, we can extract the digit here and add it to the result. Then, we can divide the number by 10 to move on to the next digit. And once we loop, if the number ended up being 0, that means that we've reached the end of all digits, so we can just return the result again. If you don't understand how this digit extraction works, you shouldn't be watching these videos. I've talked about this in a previous video, but you shouldn't try to learn how to code microcontrollers without first learning how to code in C language. And digit extracting is one of the first things taught in C language tutorials, so I suggest learning C first. Let me quickly show you how useful debugging is, even for a simple function like this. I'll quickly make a bunch of function calls with different numbers, including negative ones and zeros and etc, to test if the function works with all numbers. Also, don't forget to add the volatile keyword like I talked about in my re-entrancy video, or these lines will be optimized away. Now, I want to see these resulting variables to see if the function is working properly. To do that, I'll halt the program after these lines and read these return values. To do that, I'll put two knob instructions at the end. These lines do nothing, which makes them perfect to halt the program on. To halt the program, I'll put what is called a breakpoint on the line I want the microcontroller to halt at, which is this first knob line. You can do that by clicking the number for that line on the left. 
The breakpoint will be indicated by this red square and the highlight. I'll talk about breakpoints and everything else more in the upcoming videos, but what is essentially going to happen is that the microcontroller will automatically halt when it hits this line with the breakpoint, and when the microcontroller is halted, we'll be able to read these variables. Now we can debug this project. To debug a project, we need to build it specifically for debugging. To do that, you can click this button up here, which you can also find in the debug menu first in line. The microcontroller will be programmed like normal, but now you can see that the program has halted. You'll also see another tab open called Debugger Console. This console will show you the responses from Picket 3 that are related to debugging. It's telling us that the microcontroller hit our breakpoint at line 36 and halted. And indeed, the breakpoint we put was on the line 36. Now we can hover over these variables to see their results. And if I check them one by one, we can see that the results are correct and the function is working without a problem for all values. You can also see the line highlighted in green. This is what your program counter is pointing to right now. We halted after hitting this breakpoint here, meaning the next line to be executed is this, so the program counter is pointing to that line. This is why I said the program counter is important to know, and we'll use this green line a lot more in the future. Before ending this part, let me show you how easily I can inspect the workings of our function as well. When halted, I can remove this breakpoint and instead add another one to our function right here. Then, I can run the microcontroller again, and you'll see that the program has halted, and the PC is pointing to the breakpoint line. You'll understand why the PC is not pointing to the next line in the next video. Now I can hover over the number variable, and as you can see, the value passed to this function is 132, which makes sense since the program was halted at the end here. When we rerun the program, it looped and hit this first line, and it jumped to the function call and halted here. As you can see, the result is still zero, since we haven't executed this line yet. Now I'll execute this line and halt on the next. Don't worry, we'll talk about how to do all of this in the upcoming videos, but just pay attention to the example for now. And you can see that the result is 2, since we extracted 2 from the number 132, so it's behaving the way we expected. Let me execute another line. Of course, we looped here. And if we check the number now, it's 13 instead of 132, since we divided it by 10 here, and the fractional part from 13.2 was truncated, so we're just left with 13. If I keep executing and checking these numbers, you'll see that we're correctly extracting the digits and adding it to the result. After 3 loops, if we check the number, it's 0, since dividing a number with 1 digit by 10 would give us only fractional part, which will get truncated, so we'll be left with 0. Now, the if statement will be true, and will exit this function. I hope you could see how important debugging can be to understand the problems in your code, and this is just the surface of the iceberg. In the upcoming videos, we'll dive deeper into the topic. Before ending this video, let me give you some extra information. When I programmed my device for debugging, the microcontroller instantly started running, right? Sometimes that is not desirable. You can go to Tools, then Options, then select Embedded. Here, there's an option called Debug Startup. It's run by default, which is why the microcontroller automatically starts executing the program. You can set this to Halt at Main or Halt at Reset Vector to have your program start the debug in a halted state. The Reset Vector refers to the first programming address, which is not the same as Main. For a beginner, their difference doesn't matter, and explaining that is out of the scope of this video. But if you don't understand their difference, just choose main, and the program will start halted at the beginning of your main function. You can also reset your microcontroller at any time while debugging, which we'll talk about in a future video. And you can use this setting to make that reset either go to main or the reset vector. Again, if you're a beginner, that shouldn't matter to you, just keep it as main. In the beginning of the video, I've said that debugging is a feature of both the microcontroller and the programmer, right? To find which features you can use with your given device and programmer, go to Help menu, then click Release Notes. This will open up a web page containing various resources and documentations, but if you check the URL, this isn't an online page. These documentations are all stored in your computer, and PLAB just uses web pages to display them, which adds functionalities like clicking these links to open files and etc. Here, you have the support documentations for debugging, which you can click to find the list of programmers, microcontrollers, and their combined support or lack of it for each debugging feature. 
Now, this is the newer future list, which as you can see doesn't contain Picket 3, since Picket 3 is obsolete now. But if we go back, you can see that there's also a legacy version of this document, which is where you'll find the list containing Picket 3 supports. We can search for PIC 18F46K22 and see what is and isn't supported along with PICKET 3. But like I told you, many features not supported in hardware like this are supported in Simulator. If I go back, we can see these separate documents specifically for Simulator. We can click them to find out what feature is and isn't supported for a device, but we'll talk about the Simulator in a separate video. And that's the end of the video, and thank you for watching. If you liked the video, you can always leave a like and subscribe, it's always appreciated, and I'll see you in the next video.